acolytes, neophytes, and in today's Halloween special, maybe even Cenobites. We gather here because since time immemorial, or at least since the late 60s, metalheads have congregated around the macabre, the morose, and the insane. And that's not to say that all metal rests in the dark, but a huge chunk does so with pride. The veil of mist that surrounds heavy metal is the same fog that enraptures Halloween. Today the druids put their black robes on and explore heavy metal in Halloween. So pick those needles out of your candy, pull up a chair, because the druids welcome you to All Hallows Eve. Storm Ruler! Hit it! Let the fans know that was a one take shot. That was a one. That was that was like uh, Scorsese leading in what, what, Ray Liotta and uh, you know that fine woman straight through the back of the the restaurant, straight to their table, sit, have a seat, all one shot, all this, the hustle and bustle of the kitchen. It all went down the way it was supposed to. That was a perfect intro. That really was a perfect intro. How the hell are you doing today, big guy? Franny, how the hell are you? Uh, it's another. Perfect day to be talking about heavy metal. The skies are noticeably grayer since the last time I saw you. The mm-hmm. the hair in my beard is noticeably grayer. And I'm just feeling like a grizzled veteran ready to talk about Halloween. Oh man. I uh the with the with the gray brings the gloom because I am just a little uh ugh. probably could probably from the weekend. I had a just jam-packed weekend of uh frightened frightful activities and fun so uh yeah it was yeah i heard a, you went to i uh, heard you went to little oktoberfest down in uh, new alm nor um super german town in the southern part of minnesota absolutely yeah we went to uh new alm the uh the Sh- august shells uh oktoberfest which was fucking rad we got our uh we got we got a bunch of uh oktoberfest beers and some shells sangria which was uh, actually pretty good. I'm not a huge raspberry and or sangria fan, but nonetheless, it was still pretty good. And uh, of course, polka music. Got to have the polka music. Is it really Oktoberfest without the polka music? This will not, I'm just going to tell you right now, this will not be the first time polka comes up in this in this episode oh, oh. <laughs> predicated on Halloween. This is oh, going to be a polka fr- <laughs> Aside from, I'm not going to be riding around in the back of a van with John Candy looking for my my missing kid in Home Alone, but we're here to talk about polka. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy, I like it. Yeah, no, the uh, the 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 band that they had uh, that was doing the polka music was actually really good. They ended on uh, like a polka version of like Country uh, Country Roads by uh, I think it's John oh Vent- Denver. That it sounds was... scarier than anything we're going to talk about today. It was actually really fucking good, and everybody was <laughs> singing along. There was so many later hosens everywhere. It was fantastic. Yeah, take me home, mine country road. Like, <laughs> yeah. Would you like to get on mine country road? Like, no, I would not, Hans. No, no, Jesus. I will stay far away from that country road. Thank you very much. Well, I'm glad you survived, whether leader hosen or not. Um, and before we even kick off this... Uh, the Sam Haynes special, this Halloween special. I want to give a call out to a very special Droomy that's been with us right from the start. The type of maniac that was put in Australia because the English knew how dangerous his bloodline was. That's so right. Craig from Perth in Western Australia, uh, you know, your boys, your druids just want to give you a shout out. You've been with us from the start. And if, uh, if 1970s Ozploitation films taught me anything, it's not to fuck with a crazy Australian. So... When I told Craig O, I'd be giving him a shout out, I figured I better open the episode with this or he'd probably be hopping on a 36 hour flight to find my ass in Minnesota. So Craig, the Druids, we, we thank you for being with us. And, and to all of our young Droomies, we love to hear from you. So hit us up at any time with your thoughts. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, try to show you some love on uh, the old Druidic coven. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, shout out to you, Craig, for sure, because uh, you definitely... Uh... Like, uh, like old uh, Neckwrecker over there said, uh, you've been with us from the start, and um, you've uh, dropped some pretty good bands uh, uh, recommendations. Um, 
We'll be talking about those in future episodes. Uh, partially you're doing this shout out because I was scared that you would come find us and show us what a real knife looked like. So <laughs> that's partially why we're doing the shout out too. <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, Craig, we love you. And with that, why don't we uh, kick off our show here and talk about some of the shows we've been seeing. And I know we saw one together. And before we get to that, I'd like to, I'd like to pull you in and tell you about a really interesting show I saw just a few weeks back with some Swedish maniacs that go by the name of Screamer. Well, Screamer, first of all, you have to understand that these guys are heavy metal to the bone. They, they are that sort of, and I've said this before on the show, Franny, but denim and leather metal. I, I love that. I'm a sucker for it where it's, it's melodic. It's got grit. But it's not, it's not like, it's not death metal. It's not black metal. It's, it's playing that traditional style of heavy metal that a band like, like Saxon would, would be sitting at the back of the bar and raising their glass in the air and be like, those boys get it. Like these boys get it. These Swedish, and these are some nice boys. I, I was able to see them at kind of a really neat little venue uh, called the Underground Music Cafe in Minneapolis. And it was kind of funny because it's, it's neither underground and it fucking didn't look like a cafe. So I don't know, make that has make, make of that what you wish, but they, maybe their name isn't totally on brand, but it's really cool because it's, uh, it's in Minneapolis, but it's, it's, it's backdropped by a beautiful Minneapolis skyline. So when you're watching the band play in this case, Screamer in the background are all like the, the skyscrapers in Minneapolis lit up. It just adds a cool vibe to the show. Hell it's a yeah. small place. Staff are super cool. Lots of good beer. And I, I guess they're going to be having some sort of, uh, Word on the street, a uh, little birdie got on my shoulder and put it in my ear that they've got some sort of festival happening in early November. It was all very clandestine. They couldn't tell me a lot. So I was very much not getting the Ray Liotta table straight to the front of the show sort of treatment. But they gave me a little bit of a teaser. So I'll be excited to see shows there again. But back, back to Screamer. Franny, I know I like to ask you this, but have you, have you dabbled in the old Screamer? I feel <laughs> like I I have because I was listening to Haunt a while back and I was trying to find bands that kind of like, like fell into that style of music and I feel like Screamer came up. Mm. I've, I've or that or maybe I'm thinking of a different band possibly. Well, you know, but, like uh, that would totally make sense, honestly. Like Haunt is a natural sort of like sibling to Screamer. That sort yeah, of that, sound. Then I'm pretty sure I've listened to these guys before. Well, their live performance, just super infectious. You know, this stage, not the biggest stage in the world. And there's five guys in this band. Uh, so, you know, they're kind of a smaller setting. You got, Hen Hen boys, forgive me, but fuck, Henrik Peterson. If I, if I get anyone named wrong, fuck it. You know, what? Do, how many podcasts <laughs> are, we're trying over here, all right? Just because we're, you know, I'm partially Swedish. That doesn't mean I fucking know how to say shit in Swedish, but... <laughs> <laughs> Henrik Peterson on drums. We got this is the one I'm most likely to fumble, but uh Dijon Razic or Dijon Razic or Razic on guitar. We got Andreas Wilkstrom, Wickstrom on vocals, uh Frederick Karlstrom on bass, and Jonathan Mortensen on guitars. Very much looking like a tribe of Vikings just coming in on a inconspicuous Monday night to play this very small, intimate show. It was just a really uh, fun time. It felt like a real heavy metal sort of parking lot vibe. But I'll say this. Uh, their performance, it felt like it deserved to be on a bigger stage, occupying mm. um, a, a more, I don't know, relevant venue, a more rock and roll venue, because they played like a band who were uh, ready for the next step, so to speak. Um, and I will say, something probably went wrong with the promotion of this show, uh, I didn't really see a lot online regarding just, you know, putting the word out there. So I don't think it was as well attended as it deserved to be. And um, I'd be curious to know what happened with that. But needless to say, Screamer is a band that's officially on my radar. And uh, Droomies, Druids, Cenobites, Neophytes, whoever the fuck. I want to put it out there that these guys recently, some shitty fucking opportunist stole their catalytic converter off of their fucking van and they're on this tour. And for a band like Screamer, for a lot of heavy metal bands, the profits, you know, the margins are, are thin. So it's like, 
I don't know. If you got a, if you got an opportunity to go put a pre-order in for their new album or throw them a buck or two on PayPal, fucking do it because these are the bands that are the lifeblood of heavy metal, and it Absolutely. pisses me off when something like that happens. So, yeah, yeah Screamer. It's it's like kind of like you're saying, like the the profit margins are really thin. So anything anything like this is like it's really going to be putting a dent in like their bottom line for like when the tour comes to an end. You know what I mean? Like absolutely so it just sucks it's just you know the world everyone it's funny a lot of these bands we're going to talk about today will be touching on like the satanic panic or all the fear people felt for heavy metal but the real the real evil is just out there in the regular world like these guys are just <laughs> making music give me a guy i mean addiction hopelessness domestic violence like these are the these are the real heavy evil, war for fuck disease famine fuck yeah and these guys are making music so whatever we talk about today keep that shit in fucking perspective so for any screamer, hell of a band. I hope to see them with you sometime. And um, I tell you what, before you launch into our next show, should we uh, should we just give a shout out to the True Sagan Elite? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, Lutely, for sure, man. So True Sagan Elite, uh, the brothers Gordo and uh, Nate uh, had a uh, like a little backyard barbecue. BRBQ bash not too long ago uh, for some bands that were in town. Few of them that we ended up seeing. Notably, we got uh, Revocation, Christian, uh, and Inoculation were at this uh, kind of day off, day of rest uh, barbecue type deal. And we got to hang out with a lot of the guys and meet members of the bands and stuff like that. Uh, I was incredibly terrified of the brothers from Christian because these guys are just, <laughs> I mean, you see them and they're like, they're, they're, they're big boys. I'm a small guy. And they're, they're like, they're like head and shoulder, ab- uh, you know, over me. And I was just like, Oh boy. I was uh, very intimidated. Um, oh, they're definitely then- big boy. I mean, big boys. And then with the, the full on <laughs> sunglasses all day, just like can't be bothered to stand up and acknowledge these peasants and looking like, frankly looking like they could put in some work when they're not on tour and have no problem with the local authorities like leave those leave those boys alone because that's how they make a living absolutely (laughs) they were uh they were pretty uh very intimidating but uh, a couple other uh uh chemists the the guys from chemists were there also those guys were something else like they were a lot of good fun uh chemists are fucking hilarious i could not believe how like care I hate to say this, but like legit just charismatic, nice guys. They were like the yeah. life of the party. I could not I couldn't wrap my head around uh just where the, the conversation was going. And then by the time by the time they were pouring some backyard barbecue shots for everybody, I was merciless to the peer pressure because Franny, these shots that they were offering us that they later dubbed the backyard barbecue were three parts. Very, very important, but equally disgusting parts a1 steak sauce you got two parts tito's vodka not too bad and then some lime just a dash of lime to bring it all together and that that was known as the backyard barbecue and here we are it's well, fucking monday before the show we're both working stiffs and somehow we're taking shots of backyard barbecue at this and let's talk the food jesus christ the the true second elite i mean this this was a sh- this reminded me of a uh, hook you know that huge oh, yeah, imaginary yeah. feast like where the yeah. kids are it was nuts it was crazy yeah the the spread they they put on was was really wild man like uh, and you know I came late so like the uh, the meat was pretty good picked uh, pretty well picked over but like I saw videos and pictures of it and yeah it was a pretty impressive spread oh they were going around with shrimp and steak and <sighs> yeah and that fucking shot. <laughs> It was it was pretty it was pretty rough. I mean, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was originally going to be, but by no means does that mean it was. Oh, it was pretty tasty. It, no, 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 no. That's pretty far from it. But uh, the thing is, it just requires. You know what that drink needed was like a shaker, so that the sediment from fucking a one sauce would dis- <laughs> dissolve a little bit more. But anyway, you know, it was fun. It was a good memory. Chemist, I really enjoyed those guys. They were really funny. Um, and uh, we also got to bullshit with uh the boys from inoculation who mm-hmm. could not have been more down to earth and likable dudes absolutely yeah yeah we uh ended up t- uh talking a lot to with the uh the bassist and vocalist uh nick from inoculation yeah very cool dude uh 
was kind of telling us like some of the band's influences, especially for certain songs and albums. The uh, with uh, Miley Cyrus and uh, <laughs> what the hell is her name? Dua Lipa. Dua Lu- Lu- yeah, what the fuck is Dua, Dua Lipa? Lupe or Lipa? Yeah, du- I don't yeah, fuck. something like that. But uh, when he told me that originally, I was just like, "Wait, what? Like that's that's crazy. That that's act that's that is actually really crazy." But then you kind of I don't I don't know when you're listening to them. And we'll kind of touch on this, uh, you know, in the concert roundup or the breakdown. But uh, you can kind of catch some funky tones, like while they're while they're playing. Well, yeah, let's let's talk about let's talk about that. So the next the next night, we we were uh, still blowing the dust off our shoulders from this backyard barbecue. True second elite, fucking hashtag backyard Nate. <laughs> um, and the next very next night, we've got revocation, Christian inoculation alluvial just a packed lineup and an inoculation i believe they they opened the show yep. and um okay okay yeah that's right they did they did and i you know they're a three piece we <laughs> i don't know like we just we fucking love three pieces and there's just something fun about a band that's just three dudes like it just feels i don't know there's something old school about that uh is is this are we witnessing like the rise of the three piece or something like I mean, Inoculation, Chrissy, and Revocation, they're all three-piece bands. You've just seen, a, like, a bunch of three-piece bands in Imperial Triumphant, uh, Bewitcher. Uh, I'm sure there were some other ones that I can't think of that you've seen because you go to so many damn shows. But we have seen so many three-piece bands and or you've seen so many three-piece bands lately. I got to wonder if, like, A, there's something in the water that's going around, or B, like... We're just kind of witnessing like, uh, uh, you know, bands that that have three, you know, just the three piece bands I mean, but that are that are like getting more proficient in the roles that they have to play. So they don't need more people. You know what I mean? I think short of fears of litigation from KFC, I feel safe to say we're seeing the rise of the three piece, baby. <laughs> <laughs> They're coming in hot and heavy, but what's your apps? I mean, Motorhead for sure. Like when I think of the three piece oh, yeah. for me, I think of Motorhead. Um, but I do, th- you know, there's something cool. I think you see three pieces more in punk rock historically because of, you know, the nature of the sound. It's a little more stripped down, a little more simplified. Right. But for a band like Inoculation, a, a death metal band that flirts, that flirts with some technicality. It's really surprising that that yeah they are a three piece. So I think you're I think you're onto something there. Um, yeah, just technical death metal without being wanky. I don't even know if I would want to call them tech, but but they have some flourishes of technicality. In oh, their absolutely, music. yeah. So what what did you like about their performance? Oh man, I th- I well like I said, they, they, I did kind of went or like uh, pick up on like some like funky undertones, and again that was made evident. Uh, especially when Nick was talking about some of their influences in those guys, you know, in, in Miley Cyrus and that duo lady. Um, so it makes sense that they would say something like that. Um, that I duo was... lady, I love it. <laughs> fuck, we can't even, I don't fucking know that duo lady that works. Yeah, yeah, the duo lady. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I just, I, I really liked um, the, uh, the, oh man, I can't remember the name of the song, but the one song uh, about aliens. Oh, right, I know right, they have right. like a whole album that was like basically about aliens or whatever. Well, I mean, but... the name of the album, their most recent album is Celestial Putridity. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. all cosmic horror, cosmic death, which, you know, we've, we've kind of touched on this in other episodes, Franny. But I mean, at least me, I'm a huge sucker for Lovecraft and the idea that space is the greatest horror of all. So an album like Celestial Putridity hits all the right spots for me and punches all the right buttons for the old the old record over here. So yeah, they do. I don't know the song either, but I, I remember that as part of the show. Yeah. And then once the, once they started playing that, I kind of lost my marbles because I, <laughs> I just really vibed with that one really, really hard. But, uh, it was kind of crazy because the crowd like, wasn't like fully packed in yet. I feel like, I feel like it was still kind of empty when they started playing, which is a real bummer because I feel like inoculation put on a hell of a show. Um, sound there there was some issues with the sound but that was like throughout the whole show but the whole show kind of had some weird hit or miss spots with the sound but but you know by the time inoculation was finishing up i mean this this show was well attended and i think that um it started to look a little more full towards the back half of their set and and Mm -hmm. 
Anyone I talk, I'll just say like, if the boys hear this, anyone I talk to that saw you at that, at open that show, uh, the, everyone had great things to say. They were a powerful young band. Um, it's super, super cool merch. Uh, I forget. Oh man. I'm forgetting their merch warriors name, but he was a rad dude as well. And, uh, yeah, they're off of a maggot stomp records, which is kind of like, if you like 20 bucks spin, maggot stomp is another label to follow. They, just put out a lot of copious death metal. I mean, really hard hitting old school death metal to be, to be checked out. And uh, yeah, all in all inoculation really impressed me. And who do we have next? We had alluvial. alluvial. Yeah. Alluvial. Okay. Yeah. These boys are uh, out of Portland. Um, and this is the first time I heard of them at the show. I didn't even know they were a thing, which is, I feel like how I've been Can't finding a all. lot. Yeah, yeah, but I, I mean, like, I feel like especially um, some of the recent concerts that I've gone to, I feel like uh, I this is how I find out about some of the bands that I'm just really vibing on is like I don't even know who these guys are, but they're they're totally kicking ass right now, um, and they did they did uh, I I feel like they totally kicked ass at the concert, um, my style of metal music. Uh, kind of like a techie like deathcore feel to it um and you know me that is uh i love my i love my tech death and i i am i am unabashed and unashamed to say that i am a core fan i don't know what it is uh yeah but there's something on the inside that like whenever a core or like you know deathcore is playing i just i can't help but just start you know banging around and thrashing and having a good time um, and they're definitely like in a live setting, like it's like core music is, is phenomenal. Well, I, uh, I am definitely an abashed death core <laughs> fan. I'm, I'm on my growth journey trying to get to the unabashed side, but I'd say right now I'm still very much like Steve Buscemi in one of those Adam Sandler movies. I can't remember if it was Billy Madison or if it was happy Gilmore, but I'm Steve Buscemi at home, putting lipstick on ashamed of what I am and what I am <laughs> is a deathcore fan. And it's only and here, here I'm going to rationalize this shit immediately. This is how, you know, I've got a problem. Uh, this is why I'm not comfortable in my own skin, but it's, it's when I'm in a live setting. Yes. Franny, like I fucking totally agree with you. These, uh, deathcore bands are built for the live setting and Kevin Muller's vocals. This guy is got one of the power most powerful voice boxes going right now that I've heard in forever. Like I felt like his man, I felt like his mic could have been off and he still would have sounded just like, um, hurricane Katrina rolling through that club because he had some power to it. He sounded like, he sounded like a blowtorch and I was impressed, man. Yeah. I, uh, his vocal styling, it kind of reminded, I can't remember the guy's name, but he's the lead singer of parkway drive. Uh, totally get that vibe coming from him. Uh, yeah. And you're a hundred percent right, dude. His mic could have been off and he could have still filled the whole venue uh, like above the instruments and everything like that. It was, it was wild. Um, very powerful voice. Uh, I thought the band did a great job. Like I said, they kind of flirted with like a little tech deathy, uh, uh, you know, spots throughout the show. Um, I I felt very energized when I was listening to these guys, which <laughs> really sucked because I was literally the only one in the mosh pit while these guys were playing. And the dude, you know, kept saying, oh, you know, open this pit up. And I was just like, fuck yeah, let's go. And yeah, and then nobody else came in except for me. And I was just like, I, why? Why? Uh, you know, I totally sensed. I totally sensed that the crowd was not sure what to make of them. Not that they were not pleased. It's just, you know, this is a, ho- a huge part of the fans at this show were the Christian contingent. Yeah. And that's a whole different kind of animal. And Alluvial, they had, they definitely brought a different sound to the show. And I, I personally love, I like shows that get booked like this where, you know, you've got, you've got your headliner that's maybe a little more, you know, revocation, sort of a technical sort of band. And Christian is just a, an assault on your senses. Inoculation yeah. is this technical death metal. And, and then you bring in alluvial who they're just a stomping death core sort of band. And they, they flirt with some sounds that get a little rocky at times even. So yeah, man, I think uh, you were trying to open that pit up and uh, you, you get an A for effort. And I, I, I've been, I have been you in different shows where like, 
I remember one time I tried to start moshing at like uh, a Savage Master show, and that Savage Master is like a traditional heavy metal band. It was just all D and D nerds around me, and mm. one guy try to give me what for and put it like a shoulder into me hard. And I just remember thinking like, Jesus Christ, this is like a heavy metal show. Like there's supposed to be some moshing and step your fucking ass aside. If you don't want to be part of it. Yeah. It, it's, I, I could totally see that. It was just weird because like, you know, I was trying to, I was kind of, you know, I was trying to get people involved in the pit and stuff like that. And I remember telling you about, you know, I was like bumping into like the guys on the periphery of the, of the, of the circle. And the there was a big space opened up for a pit. Yeah, they, right? they gave you a wide berth. They yeah. absolutely gave. <laughs> there was a big space for a pit, and I was literally the only one there. So I started bumping into like people on the periphery of the ring, and like nobody was buying. And then there was this one guy that like just gently, like gingerly, like like not like forcefully pushed me, but he kind of just like kept like he just told you no. Yeah, yeah, he kept trying to force push me away very slowly. I was just like, okay, I guess, whatever. Oh, you were well. shamed and shunned, and and you didn't deserve it. They did you wrong. That's not how we treat druids here in the coven of the Black Cloth. But I will say that the next band, Chrissy, and by the time they were playing, we definitely saw some moshing. And someone oh, yeah. else, uh, a sister of your brood, we <laughs> that we went, there was this lady who I don't know what she was rolling on. I, if this was, if she, she was like the Elaine of heavy metal, Elaine from Seinfeld. Like she was like doing this weird herky jerky snake dance in the middle of the pit, touching everybody, bringing this weird, like opium den vibe to the whole show. And, and she, she definitely was trying to pull people into the circle. And, and by that time in the show, Elaine definitely got a little activity rolling with the Christian boys. But oh, absolutely. You know, Chrissy, and that's not that's not surprising because, you know, coming off of this show, I'm going to say that pretty much the same thing I always would tell you after I've seen Chrissy and is they just assault the shit out of you. They're just oh, an, yeah. an all out assault. And, um, you know, I don't know. They, they're they they're straight up like, you know, that Metalocalypse scene where uh, whatever uh, Squisgar or whatever the fuck his name is goes and he's in the blues shack he's like son you know the old blues musicians like you know boy if you really want to get good you got to learn to slow down and he yeah. just can't do it <laughs> Christian could not play a slow note if you you know pumped him full of fentanyl and laid him in the sun with a six pack of uh old English they just would never be able to slow down even if you paid them no no you're right man you're right uh, they're they're like the uh the the movie speed of the metal scene like if they go slow too slow their hearts are gonna explode or something like that like they just like they can't they can't do it but that's and you're right it was a it was a brutal like uh, an assault on the senses uh you know i i could see them being like a like a uh uh like a unrelenting bullet train from hell you know what i mean just constant non-stop you know like it it was great. I loved it. I I really did love it. Um, and yeah, the heavy metal Elaine, man, that was just hilarious. Because you're right. Like once they started playing, she was like physically pulling people into the pits and stuff like that. While you know, while these you know three Brazilian brothers are all standing up there, you know, playing their faces off and melting everybody else's. Uh, and it was it was great. It was great. It was wild, and I just want to say to the the Christian boys, if you ever hear this, thank you so fucking much because that's always what they say at every show, and I always get a a huge kick out of it. And I'm I'm so glad we got to. It's all about concerts are about the the small moments. Like of course you're there to see music, but there's all these small moments that happen at a show that make it memorable. Whether I'm at Screamer and it's the Minneapolis skyline backlighting these may these maniacs of heavy metal from Sweden, or at this Christian gig. I, I don't even know how to, this is going to be a hard story to tell. I'll just try to keep it short, but there's this, this is a Halloween show, right? And there's this troll of a man that I see at every show I go to. He's always got like some stitched together, crusty denim on. He look he looks like a gutter punk. He's a, he's a wild character. And like a lot of times I've always thought that he's just extremely fucked up. Now I don't know what to think about this kid because at this show he's headbanging like I always see him doing. And like I frequently see him doing, he's like looking down at his phone. He's ferociously 
flicking his finger down his news feed and just like imagery is flying by. Like he's going through his feed as fast as like Johnny Five would like read a book back in whatever the fuck, <laughs> whatever 80s movie that was. But he's flicking his hand like crazy. And I'm like, I start to get a little bit curious. Like, what is this kid? What is he looking at in the middle of Chrissy and set? And I was disturbed to my core because when I got a little closer to there, I saw his screen. He wasn't looking at text. He wasn't on social media. He was looking at thousands and thousands of images and, and processing them instantly of just s- simple images of isolated nipples during this Christian <laughs> set. <laughs> I have never been so disturbed and yet intrigued simultaneously <laughs> in my life. What the fuck? I know. So all I could think to say is like, as we went in and wanted to record the show, knowing it's the backdrop of Halloween, I feel like I want, you, you, we talk about being anthropologists at shows. I have felt like a sociologist or some sort of just primitive primate research assistant viewing this kid. Like what I just want to, I feel like maybe he is like George Costanza combining two worlds of extreme pleasure not in George's case, it's it's sex and food. But in yeah. this guy's in this guy's world, it's nipples and heavy metal, and he just has to combine both worlds and reach some sort of like <laughs> s- stimulatory apex. And I don't want to know what the conclusion or the climax looks like. I gave him once you lean over and see someone scanning through thousands of nipples in the middle of a death metal set, you give that fucker a wide berth. Oh yeah, absolutely, <laughs> dude. What the- but I this is what I bring to you. We're going to talk about bands. I'm going to talk. I'm also going to talk to you about the the loudness of someone wiping their ass and the guy scanning through nipples because that's the hard hitting that. coverage you're going to get. I was on just the about DOD. to say that last week it was the dude <laughs> aggressively wiping his ass with sandpaper, and this week it's the guy mixing nipples and metal. I don't know where the show is going. I am sorry to everybody. <laughs> Nipple scanner. Has been identified. So anyway, uh, well, a fantastic show. Uh, I'm glad I got to, to see that one with you. Uh, we both had to dip out early, so I can't. I don't want to cheat the listeners and try to front. I was not there to see Revocation. I've seen them before. I know they're a great band, but we both had to dip for our own various reasons. So Franny, uh, is there anything else you want to say about that? No, other than the fact that I was just super jacked up that I got to go to a a concert on a Tuesday night. You know, normally I can't do that kind of stuff because of work, but uh, in this instance, after meeting all the boys at the uh, barbecue, they kind of, they all twisted my arm with a little bit of aid from old Neckwrecker over there to just say, ah, fuck it, just come out to the show, see what you can, and then go to work like an a-hole. So well, that's exactly what I did. And it was, you're uh, just it got was a, great. You've got a heavy metal heart. And there's no, there's sometimes it just can't be stopped. Sometimes you just can't put enough roadblocks in front of a metalhead. He's going to break. Life finds a way. If Jurassic Park taught me anything, heavy metal life will find a way. It's uh, life uh, finds a way. Clearly, I stopped watching movies at about 1998 because all my <laughs> shit. Well, Franny, why don't we segue into our main topic du jour? And we're here right now to, by the time this airs, it should be pretty close to Halloween or Hallow's Eve or Samhain or Samhain, if you prefer. And we're here to talk to you about heavy metal and Halloween because they, they have always, Franny, I would say have had a special relationship. Both, both explored darker themes or the dark side of our human condition, the dark side of our psyche. They're both inextricably linked to that you know, morose side of things. Um, I also think that both heavy metal and Halloween are kind of embraced at times by the fringe elements of society. Like Mm -hmm. whether that's people that are artistically daring or those who are, you know, outcast and not going to try to, I always try to ride the line between, you know, uh, shaming the tropes that follow heavy metal and, but also exemplifying them. So when I say <laughs> the outcasts of society, like I, I don't mean that you're wearing hoop pants on fucking Maury Povich, but what I do mean is maybe you explore the, the philosophy of life. Maybe you ask questions. Maybe you see death as the ultimate truth. I don't know. But I think, uh, Franny, there's always been some metal that aims to like shock, scare, terrify, or evoke emotions. Like you can think of all the rock musicians that have had some sort of like shock or dark shtick. Um, oh, when yeah. I think of, I mean, who, who would you, when you think of like the dark 
front people of heavy metal or hard rock? Like, what are some names that instantly come to mind? Like the shock rockers or the Halloween rockers? Oh, the it has to be uh, uh, either Ozzy Osbourne or like Alice Cooper. Like totally, the, those two. Like that is the first things that come to my mind when I think of like you know horror rock or shock rock or anything associated with it or stuff that was like made intentionally to scare the shit out of kids as parents or whatever, which would just, you know, it's got to be those guys, Ozzy Osbourne, uh, Alice Cooper. I mean, for crying out loud, like, I mean, just think about it. Listen to the stories that you hear about these guys about, uh, you know, Ozzy biting the head off of a bat or a pigeon or whatever. You know, that was completely misconcepted or whatever. And it was completely blown out of proportion. And oh, I thought he fucking did that shit. He didn't do that. I thought he, I, oh boy. Oh boy. I, I thought, thought he fucking, he, I thought he chef boy RD that fucking bat and made a nice, you know, side dish of fava beans. Oh boy. Maybe he did, or maybe he thought it was supposed to be a fake one or something like that. Maybe that's what it was. I can't remember. Well, I think, uh, we're going to get the, the, the Droomies are going to have to settle the score on that one. Send us an email. Tell us, tell us what Google told you because we're going to forget about this debate. <laughs> and uh, I think, yeah, I, I mean, of course, I also think of guys, you know, and I, I, I know we're not naming necessarily heavy metal artists, but the point is like rock and roll, heavy metal are tied at the waist to Halloween at times. Like there's always been a reliance on this dark, shocking imagery for some of these artists we're talking about. So I also think of, you know, King Diamond, of course. I think oh, of absolutely. I think of uh, later iterations like Rob Zombie or Marilyn Manson, or even most recently, I think uh, Tobias Forge of Ghost. I think Ghost, he's carrying yeah, sure. on this tradition of having this sort of dark sort of aesthetic that's a little bit schlocky, but is out front and center and is selling out arenas. There's a long history of this, so you know whether it's. Stories of Dracula or Ozzy biting the head off a of bat, whether it's stories about zombies or black metal church burnings, like there is just a shock <laughs> sort of thread that 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 weaves these two things together. And you talk about Halloween. Now it's uh you know it's kind of an excuse to get for for some to get blotto or treat it like amateur hour and booze it up or dress skanky or just eat shitty candy. But Halloween is is much more ancient than than we tend to think of in our in our kind of pop cultural sense, like the Celts, the Celts. I mean, we're, we're the Druids of Doom over here. Of course, we're going to tell you about the Celts who lived, you know, thousands of years ago, uh, all, all over what is now Great Britain. But uh, mo- there's without boring us, everybody to, to tears and turning this into like an Indo-European discussion. The Celts also were all over Europe. Uh, they reached the steppes. They were down in Iberia, and they shaped a lot of the modern world in a lot of really interesting ways. And one of those ways is in this festival that they held at the end of summer and, and when the harvest was beginning and all the Celtic people were thinking, you know, with a lot of nerves, like what is the winter going to bring? What is the dark part of the year going to bring? Mm -hmm. And these are people who, you know, they very much rely on the stars and they rely on the oral tradition. They rely on their, their priest class, the Druids who at, uh, on the night of October 31st, would help the Celtic people celebrate Sam Hain, which, from what I understand, is pronounced Samhain. And and on that night, it was believed that ghosts of the dead returned to Earth. And on that night, it was believed that Druids had a special clairvoyance that they, even though they were revered year-round, but on that night, they were said to be able to see more, see more into the future about the harvest. And they would build huge, ghastly fires, and people would dress with all sorts of crazy costumes, usually like animal heads or animal skins, and they would try to tell each other's fortunes. So fast forward 2,000 years, and all of these traditions have kind of become this weird amalgamation that we now know today. And and Halloween may look different across the world, but it's wild that this pagan ritual, this pagan holiday that the Celts gave us are still being celebrated now. So That's wild, man. I had no yeah. idea it went that far back. I originally thought that Halloween was invented by the Hershey Company to sell shitty candy, but, you know, the more you know... <laughs> I don't even know if Hershey's actually makes chocolate or if they just sell brown colored wax. Anybody from Europe who tastes like Hershey's has got to just be like, what the fuck happened with the colonies? <laughs> like, Jesus Christ. We don't want you guys back anymore. You you stay over there and you keep your shitty candy too. 
Franny, I think it's time to kick off this topic in earnest. Let's talk about, let's open with the most important debate we have to settle. Freddy, Jason, and Pinhead. You got to fuck one, marry one, and kill one. Oh, boy. I'm going to say fucking straight away. Straight away with the fuck, marry, kill question. Freddy, Jason, Pinhead. I'm going to fuck the shit out of Pinhead. He's an what? extra, yeah, he's an extra dimensional hell beast. And uh, the thing about, the thing about Pinhead, hopefully... Droomies, you've seen Hellraiser, and you're aware that the Cenobites from this hellish uh, nightmare escape, they're obsessed and uh, ultimately destroyed with this obsession around pleasure and pain. So when you think about Freddy, Jason, Pinhead, fuck, Mary, kill, and you got to choose one of them, I feel like Pinhead, he's a, he's a perfect, you know, one night stand, fuck on Halloween type of guy. He, he's a... He, I get the impression, you know, he might push my boundaries a little bit. He seems like he could be into like some BDSM that I'm not quite ready for. But I just think he's the right, he's the right demon priest to cajole me into this evening. Who do you got? Who you, fuck, Mary kill, who do you got? Okay, so if you're going off of, uh, if we're doing the fuck part first and you pick Pinhead first off, uh, I have to politely disagree with you on Pinhead being the one you'd fuck because I mean he's got a head full of needles and shit like that that's not gonna be very conducive for like you know coital yeah, those, pleasures those, like, those needles ain't long enough to hit my belly button so <laughs> <laughs> that's all I'm saying is like when, he, when Pinhead is chicken heading he ain't gonna, <laughs> I ain't gonna be feeling those needles <laughs> oh god oh boy oh boy no, but okay, so if I had to choose somebody to fuck, <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna be Freddy, okay? I'm picking Freddy, and I'll tell you why. He lives in the dreamscape, okay? For people, you know, everybody that hasn't seen the movie, Freddy, he kills his victims, uh, you know, torments them in their dreams. Um, and that's why I feel like I would wanna bang and or be banged by Freddy, because he lives in the dreamscape. Imagine all of like the freaky ass shit that could happen that can't be done in real life and where it could be done. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it there you are literally bound by your imagination and what you can dream up, okay? That that is that is the the limit of what is possible with Freddy. And not only that, it it'll give uh, it'll give all of his victims a nice little show, a nice little happy uh, happy show before you know he slaughters them. So you know that all makes. I mean, Freddy, I gave I gave a lot of consideration to like, do I want just a one night? St I, here's the thing about Freddy, as compared to Pinhead, I don't have to worry about keeping him away from puzzle boxes. I can go to games by James and and take a look at what they've got without fucking having to worry. Will Pinhead try to extract this shop, keep and put him into a world of pain? So there is that Freddy's got going for him. But for me, you, Fr Freddy is not a one night fuck. Freddy, he's the one you marry. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> Freddy is not a one night stand, my friend. Freddy's so much more. He's a dreamer. Whether he's like dreaming up a deck or a boiler torturer room, he thinks big. And I just get the sense that he's the kind of the kind of guy you can build a life with. He's got he's got a plan. <laughs> he can he can realize steps A to B because he's been a dreamer his whole life. And I think he's probably a jazz man. He's got that fedora. <laughs> I, I I just got a sense that he likes refined things. He's shown he's creative. He made that fucking glove. I mean, that's really resourceful. And the thing about that glove, he's ahead of the curve in terms of using secondhand materials. He's repurposing all the... So he's earthy. I love that. He, he's a boiler man. You know he's a handyman. So if shit breaks in my house... And look... Freddy's a guy you, you got to keep around. He's also shown that, you know, he's always interested. He's been interested in children. And I think that's, a, <laughs> I just think that's oh a really, <laughs> uh. it's just an admirable sort of thing. But I, all that said, I do worry about Fred bringing work home with him. So, <laughs> <laughs> so i mean yes he is interested in children maybe for the wrong reasons but <laughs> i'm walking down that aisle he can keep his red and green sweater i'll wear a red and green kilt so freddie i do <laughs> okay oh boy all right well uh for you, you chose freddie to marry and i'll tell you who i'm gonna choose to marry and it's pinhead <laughs> <laughs> 
No. <laughs> no, it's not. It's Jason, okay? And t- I'll tell you what. Jason, he's a strong, silent type, okay? He's very down to earth, you know. He very quiet, very reserved, you know, individual. Probably not going to have a whole lot of arguments. And if you do, it's probably just going to result in maybe a pinky being lost or like a wall being smashed through or something like that. But you know what? That can all be fixed. Sans the pinky part. Well, I suppose if you get it on ice fast enough, it could be could be fixed. But um, yeah, I, I, I choose I choose Jason. OK, I, I, just, I just feel I just think there's just too much to overcome with jason like whether look are you talking about his size or like (laughs) i mean look he's got both he he, i'm gonna come off vain but there's just he's got some facial deformity and that coupled with his extremely limited cognitive abilities like it'd be one thing if he was like you know this masked appreciator of fine art and he was actually really articulate and could have these fantastic conversations but no and not only is he a a, a chore to look at but he he speaks in monosyllabic grunts like he's got nothing to say and and also you know this dude he's i guarantee jason's fucking homeschooled he, he's been in isolation for years <laughs> i mean on the plus side i'll say i'll give i'll say a nice thing about him before i tell you what i do to him but i do appreciate that he's an outdoorsman you know he's really into camping i've, I've heard that he's done some amazing conservation with his efforts to preserve crystal lake And that deserves mentioning. But I think for me, even if I sound like I'm coming out vain, I would just not want to always have to sit there guessing what he was thinking because a fucker can't say a goddamn thing. Oh, and by the way, this dude is carrying some major goddamn trauma. Like, you you go ahead and marry Jason, but you're going to be playing a white knight the rest of your days. So that for all of those aforementioned (laughs) reasons for me, Jason is the one I'm going to fucking kill. I'm going to put him six feet under. Hold up, hold up. I, I'm sorry to cut you off here. But you have got, you, you're marrying, you're marrying Freddy, whose face is so fucked up. And he he's distinguished. He's unique. Oh, Once oh, you get to my. know him. Oh boy, oh boy. I'm sorry to cut you off. I just had to get that out of the way because that was bugging me as soon as you said his gr- that Jason was grotesque. And I'm just like, wait, hold up. Freddy's face is fucked, dude. <laughs> Freddy's face is symmetrical. Freddy's face doesn't look like it's been hit with a shovel 15 times. <laughs> and in the dark, hey, look at Freddy. He's so conscientious. He puts that hat on in the right lighting in a jazz club. You can't tell. You and the way, he right. hold, the way he holds your hand, it's dynamite. With or without the glove? Depends on the night. Yay. <laughs> 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 All right. Tell me how you're going to kill... Or why you want to kill Jason. I just, I mean, I got to pick one. I got to fuck Pinhead. I got to marry Freddy. So that leaves Jason. I'm putting you in the ground. I know you're afraid of water. So I got to try. You know, I think I got to lure him back to Crystal Lake where it all goddamn started. Under the guise of maybe some sort of retreat. Like we're going to unpack your demons. But really, no, dude, you're just going to take that. I'm going to put you in Davy Jones locker and be done with you. So, so those are, those are, who are you? Who are you uh, killing over there? Uh, it's Franny gotta land. be, it's gotta be, uh, it's gotta be pinhead. I mean, he's gotta, he, he's gotta be killed because you know, okay. Say you have a one night stand with pinhead, right? And shit doesn't go well, or it does not end amicably. We all know that pinhead can bring, you know, uh, his victims back to life or, or, uh, return them as the Cenobites in his army or whatever. Right. I could just see him like, going on a date and it doesn't end well he's gonna bring back all of your exes to just constantly like traumatize you and just make your life a living hell so that's why he's got to be stopped and he's got to be killed but also like i said his head is full of pins and that just would not be good for marrying or sexing what if the pins in his head are like the notches on his belt so every time he has a one night fuck he's got to put a new pin into his head That's kind of romantic, so I'm I'm sticking with my pick. Oh, boy. And on top of that, I feel like Pinhead, he looks like he probably listens to Industrial. So we'd at least have some shit to talk about. Maybe he's like a, you know, got a a deep catalog of old albums that we can wax on. Oh, sure. Yeah, so I think... You know, it's uh, it, with with bachelors like these. It's, it's not an easy <laughs> no, choice. No, it's very hard to pick, man. I've uh, I've appreciated your thoughts on that, and um, you know, I think. Uh, one thing to say also about 
Halloween and heavy metal, we've already kind of touched on is that there's a, such an ex exploration of the dark side of humanity. And so when you think about art mediums that really dive into that, and that Halloween is such a perfect vessel, you, you think about horror movies and you think about heavy metal, and those two things pair really well, heavy metal and horror. So for this next segment, Droomies, Cenobites, Neophytes, Boiler Room Attendants, the Druids are gonna tell you how to pair a perfect horror movie with just a tasteful heavy metal album and why. I'm going to I'm going to lead off with a darker I'm going to I'm just going to come out of the gate and get the darker shit out of the way because I don't think I can spend too much mental energy in the space needed to talk about these two. But the movie is Martyrs and the album is uh by Bethlehem and it's Dictius Te Nicar. Mm. Hopefully I got that right, but if I didn't get it right and you want to listen to this Bethlehem's 1996 release, Dictus Te Nakar, pairs perfectly with just the most vile, repugnant, beat you down, nihilistic, disturbing movie experiences I've ever seen in the form of Martyrs. And it's really important if you decide to go down this rabbit hole and, and watch this movie, you have to watch the French version of the film. Uh, but Martyrs. I'm not going to even, I'm going to try to ride this line about not telling too much about this because you should go into that movie blind. Do not read about that movie. Go into it blind. And without giving a lot of spoilers, I'll say these two pair perfectly because both will just beat you down into such a depressed, bleak state. It's not so much that they scare you. It's that they just strip you of all positive emotion. Mm -hmm. They just reduce you down to a nub. Bethlehem, on this release, they have... I'm just laughing in my head thinking about my friend Pat, who's heard me say this a million times. All over my metal career, I have never heard more tortured vocals than what Bethlehem do in their early career, specifically around this album, Dictius Te Nakar, Nakar, whatever the fuck. And also they've got a track on Gummo, which is a disturbing film. Check that track out. But both of these movies will leave you bleak. They're torturous. Uh, they don't revel in human suffering. They just are suffering. Mm. They are pain exemplified. It's the sound of losing one's mind. Uh, and I'll just give an honorable mention. If you decide to watch Martyrs and you decide to listen to this Bethlehem release, don't do it back to back. But there's an honorable mention to Leviathan's The 10th Sub-Level of Suicide. That's the other album I thought of with pairing these two. It's an utterly depressive journey into the bleak. So, all ye who enter, abandon hope as they say. But Martyrs, I'd pair it with Bethlehem. Franny, what do you got? Well, before I get into my first one, I just want to say that I think you were to you told me about this this movie Martyrs before. Uh, you, I, I specifically remember you saying to watch the French version, and, and it was. I don't want to say what you what you told me because it was kind of a little bit of a spoiler. Uh, spoiler, but uh, yeah, it from what you how you described it, it was. Uh, <laughs> very bleak and brutal to put it. <laughs> well, it's so interesting because, you know, the movie, it, it, it puts the viewer into a position where you will have sort of an existential mm -hmm. crisis by the end of it. By the end of the film, you feel like the protagonist. You go on this journey where you have a sort of metamorphosis of your own. It's not a movie that I would say is even necessarily entertaining. I'm not even saying it's uh, a good movie. It's just incredibly important. It's it's a movie I'll probably never watch again, but I'm so glad I did. Mm. So it's a weird recommendation to give, but if you're of a certain sort of steel and you really want to see what humanity can create, short of watching something that's not even with with artistic merit, like this has a lot of artistic merit. Yeah, check out Martyrs. Mm. I still have to watch it, but I do. I do want to watch it. Um, all right, let's see. My uh, my first one, my first uh, uh, movie slash metal album pairing. Uh, I was gonna take us back to the eighties. Okay, and we're gonna talk about John Carpenter's The Thing, and uh, kind of you know li thinking over in my head like what what I pair it with. I I have to pick something that's just as cold, uh, as terrifying as the movie itself. Uh, and I picked uh, Crypt of Ice by Frozen Soul. Now, why would I pick this? 
Um, well, like I said, perfect. I, I both, I think that both the, the setting of the movie is, is cold and creepy. And so is, uh, the album uh, crypt device, but they're also both brutal because some of the things and imagery that you see in the movie are brutal AF and some of the uh, feelings that the uh, the album by Frozen Soul evokes is also brutal AF. The song Faceless uh, Enemy kind of makes that connection even stronger between the two because, you know, in the movie, the thing, it, it assimilates. So we, we don't really know what it looks like. As far as I re- as far as I remember, it has been a little while since I've seen them uh, from the, uh, seen the thing. But as far as I remember, the thing what it looks like it looks like whatever the fuck it wants to look like. It has this shape shifting ability to take on its host and all the animals it touches. That that's the beauty of the thing is it can be any life form it gets to know exactly. Ex- so it assimilates. So we don't really know what the thing looks like, um, and that's how. Uh, you know, it's, it's terrifying to think of. You don't know who's your friend, who's your enemy. Is this, is this really a neck wrecker I'm talking to? Or is this a fucking assimilating alien from another planet that's trying to like snuff out life as we know it? I don't know. And that's, what's so terrifying about it. Um, and I, like I said, I think the song faces enemy really makes that connection stronger. Um, and while, uh, the thing could potentially be slowed down or contained possibly killed by fire uh there's no slowing down frozen soul that's oh yeah so that's where the t- two kind of diverge a little bit uh but uh yeah th- um i think that's why i chose uh crypt device by frozen soul just both cold both uh both scary both uh creepy and both bring on a sense of terror in your bones man the thing is such a uh, john carpenter's got so many good movies but the thing is such a film and the special effects are amazing. Oh yeah. I just love that movie. And those are those are two great picks and holy cow, we've got a little synergy with my next ah. pick and your last one the thing the thing was of extraterrestrial origin and my pick for movie scared the shit out of me as a kid. This movie had me up at night. This movie had me with my lights on for, you know, I want to say like a legit 18 months. Wow. But the film was fire in the sky. And the band is Hypocrisy. The album is Abducted. So you can see a theme right now. It's all about aliens between this Fire in the Sky movie and Hypocrisy Abducted. And I'll just say, in a simpler time, the 1990s, whether it was X-Files or Independence Day, like we just had a whole lot of alien obsession like ufos were on every issue of the inquirer this is well before reddit this is well before message boards so that's where you got your bullshit from and with this is we know this is not a political show but i'll just say that conspiracies were fun in the 90s like people all love to talk about well what the fuck is roswell 47 what's going on there and why don't we get to know what we demand answers mr president and so (laughs) Fire in the sky, it's the the premise is all this dude got abducted and experiments were done on him. And that to me is just a terrifying premise. This idea that this intelligent life force traveled through the eons of space time to get here and to do nothing but just treat us as cattle to be experimented on. Yeesh. That scared the shit out of me. And Hypocrisy, their album Abducted, It's just so many songs touch on just like this existential fright about space, about aliens, about being abducted. There's literally a song, Roswell 47, that has got a hook from hell that'll get stuck into your head for two decades like it did me. Uh, This album, Abducted, is like an ocular probe coming at you just like fire in the sky, a millimeter per second. And this this horrible, sentient alien gray life doesn't give a shit about the dump in your pants because this is happening. <laughs> and so for for me, Fire in the Sky pairs oh, perfectly, magnifico, with Hypocrisy Abducted. Oh, wow. I could totally see that, uh, you know, absolutely scaring the, the, the shit out of you when you were a little kid because if that's, uh, yeah, that movie is, is pretty goddamn... Uh, creepy. I was not. Uh, I was not a fan of it when I saw it. If that's the same movie that I'm thinking of, but uh, yeah, it was. Ugh. 90s parents were different. Like I felt oh, like my parents boy. were conservative, and, and even they were like, "Well, yeah, fuck, watch whatever you want." And I should not have been. That movie was too intense for my little no, mind. Oh my god, I totally uh, agree because, like, <laughs> I mean, 
just thinking of some of the movies that I've seen growing up. Yeah, like The Fly and stuff like that. Oh, The Fly. The, no, that the Fly was awesome. The, it, I thought it was great. You know, I, I, I was creeped out when I was a kid. But like I said, I was should not have been able to watch that when I was a little kid and was just, hey, want to watch a movie, Franny? Oh, yeah, sure. Why not? I can't believe that Jeff Goldblum once was you know, part human, part insect. And then just a few short years later, he's laying on the side of, you know, a, a bronchiosaurus and just taking in the breath like it's no thing. Like that must have been how he became a, a, a chaos theory uh, magician. Oh, of course. Is what ex- what he experienced in The Fly was is of another world. That movie, wow. We got to have just a whole, a whole other day to talk about horror movies. Oh, man. I, I, and it'll happen in the future for sure. But, um... Uh, I guess kind of continuing on with this theme that I've been noticing here is more fucking aliens. Um, and my, <laughs> my, my next movie is killer clowns from outer space. And oh boy, the only thing that you can pair with killer clowns from outer space are killer clowns from outer space in Guar. Uh, like I feel like it. <laughs> There's no other band that you can pair with that movie if you're going to put a metal uh, metal soundtrack to it. And uh, specifically, the album I chose is their uh, second album, uh, Scum Dogs of the Universe. Um, I feel like with the you know insanely over the top, uh, shticky horror comedy, um, it's only fair to to pair it with a completely over the top shticky band in Guar, and especially with the scum dogs of the universe i feel like they were really kind of starting to hit their stride uh with that album but um yeah there's if you were a waiter at a restaurant and that was the combination you gave me i would come back to you every week because that is the perfect combination <laughs> I, I there's re- like there's really nothing else to say about it like if you haven't seen the movie check it out because like the, the whole premise is fucking bonkers like these weird alien cl- cl- that look like killer clowns come from you know uh t- you know crash on earth and people think it's like Haley's comet or whatever and turns out to be like they're wrapping people up they're putting bodies inside of cotton candy and drinking you like you're a fucking juice box yeah and then they jesus christ they shrink you down and turn you know they shrink you down and throw you into like a popcorn box it's a, the, the whole movie is just fucking bananas uh so if you haven't you know that might be one of the few situations, though, Franny. Like, horror movies are filled with dumb fucking white people that are so naive and just walk into their death and their demise. But if you put a fucking neon clown tent in the middle of a field that's pulsing light and has, like, amazing music coming from it, I'm going to be one of those people walking, like, with a strand of drool from my mouth oh, straight in a bees line towards that goddamn tent. A hundred percent. There is a zero percent chance of me turning around and walking away. I am going to be a moth to the flame, and I'm heading straight for that fucking godforsaken tent. No questions asked. I am not the final girl in that movie. <laughs> no. I'm the fucking second. I'm the second death <laughs> yeah, in that movie. Absolutely. Like, let's get this fucking, let's get this small fry out of the way because he's too fucking easy. Absolutely. No, no, no argument on that. I, I'd probably be the first Excellent death. Excellent selection. You're, if, you're the, if you're the second, I'm probably the first. Uh, but yeah. if you, You're the fucking opening scene. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're, you're the guy that just like they show in the goddamn trailer. Like he's so, he, he's such an easy kill that it gets two seconds on the trailer. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so if you haven't seen Killer Clowns from Outer Space, definitely check it out. It's just a, it's a trip. Um, and then Scum Dogs of the Universe by Guar again, just a just a trip in a, of an album. Like the whole band and their discography is is a real trip. But uh, yeah, definitely oh, check question. definitely well, check them out. Man, that just got a huge pop out of me. So I don't. That's gonna be hard to follow. But uh, hey, Vern, you know what I mean. I think I have one for you. The movie is. And when you talk about the classics of cinema, of course you've got The Godfather. I mean, and and you've got Goodfellas, uh, and you The Departed, or wh- whatever you whatever you might reach for. This should be right next to those sacred films, right at the pinnacle of American cinema. Cinema, Ernest Scared Stupid. Oh, that's the movie. Goddamn masterpiece. And the album is by Fintrell. It's uh, Jetkins Tid. Now. If you've ever seen any earnest goddamn movie, you know that he's like just a bumbling fucking idiot. He's not smart. He's always getting into haphazard situations by sheer virtue of his 
brain dead stupidity. Like he makes Beavis and Butthead look like research assistants. <laughs> and this is perhaps Ernest at his dumbest and Ernest scared stupid. This movie is just like such a 1990s campy, silly, spooky sort of comedy. Like it's, it's totally schlocky as fuck all. So it, it, this is, it's a good movie to follow killer clowns. Cause it's very much in that vein, but Ernest, this old derp, he finds this tree and inside that tree is a troll. And that troll turns kids into wood. And actually it's kind of a, it's kind of heavy when you when you think oh, about it on the surface. Hundred percent, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's collecting little kids as little wood figurines, like he's you know coming out of a Chuck E. Cheese with his uh, his rabbit foot as a memento, putting it on his his <laughs> shelf where he does his dishes. Like I got all these little bad. He's collecting kids like Beanie Babies, and he's turning them into wood. And here comes our oh, here comes our hero. Ernest, scared shitless like usual, but somehow they find out that milk can kill this troll. I don't know. It's a silly, stupid kid horror movie, but it centers on this mythic troll. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of things I, I thought of when I thought about an album that could pair with this, but ultimately you got to go with Finn Troll. You got to go with their second album, Jackins Tid. That's, and maybe it's Yatkins Tid. I don't know. But this is really where they hit their their bubbling cauldron best. And they combined, oh, hey, P polka callback. This is where they combined the Finnish polka, known as Humpa, with sort of like a, a black metal aesthetic. And what you have is a perfect movie to follow up Ernest Scared Stupid with. They're both fun, they're both silly, and they leave you feeling like, wow, that was a good time. So, yeah, Finn Troll and Ernest Scared Stupid. Hell yeah, man. Uh, I... It's been so long since I've seen that movie, but I can almost, like, as you were describing it, I can almost do, like, the whole play-by-play -play of it, like, in my head. <laughs> I'm just like, man, that movie was a good one. All right. Uh, quick question, though. Side note, but related to Ernest. Besides Ernest Scared Stupid, what's your favorite Ernest movie? Uh, Ernest Goes to Camp? God damn, yes, dude. That, <laughs> that is the best one. Ugh. I don't, these movies are like etched into my little kid mind and I only can grab for like loose imagery and like one liners. I don't remember a lot, but I do remember liking that movie as a kid. And you know, the, the it, Ernest Scared Stupid, here's how dumb this movie is. I remember this is the thing that stuck out to me most as I was uh, trying to recall what this movie was about, but they defeat the troll with fucking milk. Yeah. Except uh, there's like this whole myth around like uh, the mother's, mother's helper or something along those lines. And they're like, uh, well, what the fuck? This is a riddle with these little dumb shit, middle school kids. And they're not much smarter than Ernest. They can't figure out what this <laughs> riddle is. And well, it turns out mother's helper is like fucking milk. So, you know, shout out to this poor lactose intolerant fucking troll. He's just trying to live a future lifestyle. He's drinking almond milk. He's watching what he eats and some fucking dipshit janitor crashes into his tree fucks up his house and now he's got these little kids trying to go after his collection of wood sculptures all in all i side with the troll I, I was about to say i'm on the troll side in this one i'd be pissed too and not only that but we know some people that milk would kill uh, so like oh, yeah. I, i'm seeing where the I, i'm seeing where the troll's coming from he's just misunderstood that's all well i think uh to close out my recommendations i could wax on this for days but so to close out our little cheese and wine pairings here, uh, Cenobites and Neophytes, all you fucking degenerates. Franny, the movie is Zombie 2, and the band is Fulci. Fulci, of course, is the, the famous Italian director of, of the zombie series and other horror gore fests. And uh, the album by Fulci is the name of the band. Fulci is the guy who directed Zombie 2, the name of the album if you're not confused yet, is Tropical Sun. So here we have Zombie 2, directed by Fulci, and a band named Fulci, <laughs> album Tropical Sun. Oh, boy. Jesus Christ. You know, this is like when you save your, your hardest homework assignment for the last <laughs> thing on the night. Like, no, you do the hard one you're, first. You gotta get it out of the way. Jesus, I should have got Fulci out of the way. Fuck. But why do I pairing these things together? Well, first of all, when it comes to Zombie 2, unlike a Romero zombie movie, there is no goddamn comic relief here. Fulci, as a director, his zombies are far more gory and just killing as my business. So you're going to see eyes being gouged. You're going to see flesh being pulled from bone. You're going to see rib cages being spread. For its time, 
It's score on a different level. And you contrast Zombie 2 with, like, say, a George Romero's Dawn of the Dead set in a mall, kind of fun and campy, maybe with some themes about, like, consumerism and satirizing our culture. No, 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 no. Zombie 2, this is these these horrible uh, death incarnate creatures risen from the dead are here to fucking eat you. And so Fulci, as a band, they put out this album, Tropical Sun. And... This is just grimy, Neanderthal, brutal death metal. It is not here to give you flashes of technicality. It is not here to show you sweeps and try to impress the bros. There's no anchory. This is just very groovy, skull-stomping death metal. And besides the fact that the album is in homage to Fulci, so there's a natural connection, the band has all sorts of uh, uh, sound bites mm. and sound drops from the zombie series and from oh, horror wow. in general. So yeah, yeah. So so Zombie Two is the film. If you haven't seen it and you've already cut your teeth on all the classics in the zombie horror genre, and you haven't seen this one, go check it out and follow it up with Fulci's Tropical Sun. And I should have said this too. These guys are Italian. That's perfect. Fulci was Italian. Like that's how do you want to take your music to the next level? Well, be an Italian band <laughs> singing about zombies, about an Italian director who filmed about zombies. Like that's <laughs> yeah. the shit. Oh man. Uh, yeah, that's all. That sounds really good. I remember seeing uh, some Fulci movies before. Yeah. And they're, they're, on, they're on another level. Those zombie movies are not, not to be trifled with. They don't fuck around. Not one bit. <laughs> um, well, I think, uh, and as a subtopic, there's so many heavy metal esque movies that just t- that would be perfect for a metal album, like I, Event Horizon or The Conjuring or Hereditary, all stand out to me. But there's just a lot of necromantic. I mean, there's a Cannibal Holocaust for fuck's sake. That's like basically Cannibal Corpse just in a movie form. But there's just this is such a fertile this is fertile ground for us to plunder, and we're not. We know we're leaving a lot on the table. Well, it's it's funny you bring up Hereditary because this is my last pairing as well. Oh, you do have one. More. Yeah, yeah. So it's it like I said, it's funny you bring it up. Um, so my, the movie I'm choosing is Hereditary. Uh, this is billed as like one of the scariest movies in decades. Um, and the the album that I am pairing it with is uh, a collaboration between Lou Reed and Metallica. The album is Lulu and it is the worst fucking album I've ever heard for the worst fucking horror movie I have ever seen in my entire goddamn life. Holy shit. Uh, I'm not even taking the bait (laughs) To, to all of our listeners. This guy has no taste. Hereditary is a fantastic fucking movie. Modern masterpiece. No, oh, yeah, no. And I just rem- this so this dude, it's so he eats Totinos bad. and he likes it. So, it's so that's all. Bad. That's all you need to know. It's so fucking bad. If- oh, you know one I left on the cutting room floor, which I wish I hadn't. I'm just Deicide and The Exorcist. Boy, that's a pairing. That's gonna be for next year. Something's there. I know it. I just missed it. But I just, I'm feeling it right now. Deicide pairs with either like The Exorcist or The Omen, maybe even Rosemary's Baby. But something is there to be found later. That would definitely be a good one, to, good pairing, um, for sure. Um, well, well, that's all the pairings that I have. Um, that's all the pairings we've got for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, call back. Call back to Craig in Western Australia. Craig, if you haven't seen Wake and Fright, this 1970s terrifying Australian film, that's your homework, my friend. Go see Wake and Fright and see what happens when a town just devolves into an alcohol-fueled, nightmarish hellscape, uh, totally uh, enamored with addiction and gambling and people losing this hopelessness personified, but wake and fright, Craig. I want to see you watch that movie and get get back to your druids on that. Um, another call out, Franny, just real quick to another longtime listener, Matt the Rat Williams. He was cool enough to, to shoot in some recommendations of his own. So, so Droomies, you know, get in touch with your boys. Let us know what you're thinking because we want to talk about it on the show. But Matt, when I asked him, well, what are some heavy metal albums? What did the rat have to say when he's like, these are the albums that make me think of Halloween. So just real quick, these are what he had. He had Misfits by, you know, American Cycle by the Misfits. Absolutely. He had uh, Splatter Thrash by Ghoul. He had Megadeth, Killing is My Business. Uh, uh, the Cramps, 
songs the Lord taught us. So that's kind of, you know, that's getting out there. And I like the way he's thinking about this. He had Bathory under the sign of the black mark, ghost, opus, eponymous. And then this, uh, these next two, I think, Franny, are going to be more your cup of tea. But possessed seven churches and death scream bloody gore. Oh, man. Oh, God. So he shot us a lot of great recommendations, including White Zombie and Sam Hain. So all in all, you know, we're, 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 we appreciate you, The Rat. You keep that information coming. You keep working on that pending side project that we're all excited about, Atomic Sludge. We can't wait to hear your vocals across the whole album. Hell yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. So fertile ground to be plundered, heavy metal and Halloween. Well, Franny, a Halloween Druids of Doom metal special would be uh, sacrilegious if we didn't at least have a, a segment to the King of Diamonds. And that might be, that's something different here locally, but uh, we are talking, King of Diamonds is a fucking strip club over here, Jesus Christ. Well, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about King Diamond. That's right. For the longest time, I could not tolerate King Diamond. And in heavy metal circles, that is like, that's something that, you know, they'll say, leave the hall over. Like this dude is, uh, rightfully so, he's deeply respected and revered. But, um, you know, for the longest time, I just could not get into King Diamond. And it's, you know, for obvious reasons. Like the same thing that makes him iconic is for me, one of the things that makes him really hard to listen to, at least previously. Mm -hmm. But it's his insane vocal range. He spends a lot of time up in his his upper registry in oh, that yeah. f that falsetto from hell, that demon falsetto from hell that everybody instantly knows. But for me, early on, that really was a hard thing for me to get into. And I know he doesn't just hang his head on his voice. He's got the iconic face paint. Uh, he's a, a just a fantastic storyteller. His live show is spectacular with set pieces and costume changes. And it's just very much... Um, Everything's on a very grand scale, but you know, when you're just trying to dive into this guy, just break into him, you don't know all of that necessarily. Mm -hmm. All I knew was his voice, but what finally made him click for me was within the last couple of years, oh, go figure, you know, heavy metal, I don't typically take the time to, to read lyrics. There's just so much music to consume oh, yeah. and that slows me down. But when I finally started to go through his albums song by song and following the lyrics, it's like I had a aha, like watershed moment. And I realized King Diamond is all about the fucking stories. Uh, this guy, all of his albums do a fantastic job of just painting scenes of the macabre scenes of the, uh, of the insane, horrifying tales that take you from a, a journey of confusion to one of complete devastation. And even if not all of his albums are a concept album, I've just really started to get pulled into his music on a specific album called Abigail. And I want to talk to you about that a little bit in depth today. Uh, and all you probably know this, but King Diamond is a purported uh, like Anton LaVey Satanist. But what's interesting is... Apparently, he doesn't really see it as an actual religion, but more a philosophy. Uh, so in other words, he doesn't, as far as I understand it, he doesn't see like Lucifer as an actual deity, but it's more like he embraces this uh, philosophy of freedom, of questioning things. Mm -hmm. uh, he's very actually anti-religious. So on paper, the whole satanic shtick seems to really just be like a storytelling medium sure. for him. So. With all that scene setting, let's talk about Abigail. This uh, this this album is Franny. This is some straight Doctor Phil shit. This is Maury daytime <laughs> shit. It's um it's full of just all kinds of uh, high drama. So like if if cell phones had existed in the 1850s when this story is set, there would have been some serious posts on Reddit about what was going down. <laughs> and. I mean, like, it's it's predicated on a haunted-ass old mansion and this young couple, this couple Miriam and Jonathan LeFay. They, you know, LeFay, Jonathan LeFay inherits this fucking mansion. And first of all, Franny, as they're moving in, you know, think of your U-Haul just pulled up to your brand new Victorian home. You're all excited. And seven horsemen pull up and they're like, no, don't fucking move into this house. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. Like, if a single horseman did that, I'm immediately packing up my truck and getting the fuck out oh, of yeah. there. But do they listen? No, they don't listen. The, the horsemen are like, look, if you move into this place, 
18 will become nine. And Jonathan and Miriam, they have no idea what the fuck that means. They ignore the horsemen and they move in. Big fucking mistake. Of course. The house is haunted by Count Lefay. Jonathan's like, you know, long lost great uncle or some shit. I don't fucking his, know. But the point his is, great, it's his great grandpappy. His great great grandpappy <laughs> left him the fucking house. He left him the gun, the house, the plow that his grandma used to push. He's got all kinds of memorabilia. But he's fucking haunting the place, this count. And this count, on the first night, he's like, yo, Jonathan, take a look at this casket. And this casket's got the stillborn baby, Abigail. And it turns out, Miriam is carrying the ghost of Abigail. And this child must be reborn. So straight away, King Diamond, this album, Abigail... Like when you listen to it, you will, if you don't sit down and follow it song to song, you would never know what's actually going on. But once I did, I was like, oh, hell no. King Diamond, I'm going to listen to all of his albums and follow all the stories. And this is what hooked me in was going lyric by lyric into this, this deep dive approach into his work. Um, the funny thing about the funny thing, I got a dark sense of humor, but uh, the count is basically telling Jonathan, you know, you got, you got to kill this bitch. <laughs> You got to kill this bitch before <laughs> Abigail is born. So uh, previously, the count had pushed his cheating ass wife down the stairs. And hence, Abigail was born, still born. So there's a whole history of men, the uh, Lafay men pushing their spouses oh, downstairs. Boy. There's just a whole lot of intergenerational trauma being passed on from the count to Jonathan. You know, bad smells are happening. Random church bells are ringing. Miriam gets some sort of immaculate conception and like in a in the in like a two day period she's as big as a house full with baby Abigail possesses Miriam and pushes Jonathan down the Ooh. stairs. So this is why I'm saying like this is Dr. Phil shit. Plot twist. The horseman plot twist. Yeah, Jonathan goes down the fucking stairs and and the whole story closes with the horseman returning to find Abigail in the cellar and she's eating something. And oh, guess what she's eating? She's eating her old body, the Holy old dead baby fuck. in the casket. And the horsemen drag this bitch out and bury her ass under a chapel and they shove spikes through her, nine spikes through her. And they the whole thing comes to a conclusion because the horsemen warned Jonathan that if you move in here, 18 will become nine. Well, the thing is, Miriam was 18 and she would become nine months pregnant. Oh, boy. So if you're if you're an, not initiated to King Diamond, this is the sort of storytelling he's going to take you to from start to finish. If you haven't delved into his work yet, I totally would recommend starting with Abigail. It's where the band really hits their melodic stride and storytelling and in the perfect balance. Wow. Can't say good enough. I mean, it's just a gripping. It's some Dr. Phil shit, though, for real. I'll definitely have to check that out because uh, I, I am a fan of Merciful Fate. Uh, and we know the lead singer is also uh, King Diamond was in Merciful. The lead singer, yeah, <laughs> the lead singer. Uh, the, um, he was in Merciful Fate. You know the the voice of Merciful Fate. And oh yeah, of course. Uh, I, I I'm now I'm curious to see if the the lyrics of you know Merciful Merciful Fate songs have like the sense of story as like King Diamond songs. You know I I never really listened to King Diamond, um, before really a whole, a whole lot. I've heard a couple songs here and there, but I'm definitely going to have to go back and, and check out Abigail now because just he, hearing you describe like the story of the album sounds, sounds uh, incredible. And I, it's, it's, I, it's something I want to experience myself. So I, my hope is that I've planted a seed and now all of our listeners who haven't done this already are going to go listen to Abigail. They're going to pull up the lyrics and follow it song by song. Cause it's a journey. I'm definitely going to have to try that for sure. Well, Franny, that uh, wraps up the Halloween portion of today's episode, but this would not be the Druids of Doom if we weren't helping to guide your listening journey, if we weren't coming at you hot with some album reviews that you need to experience. In this episode, I've got one for you. I've got Spirit World, Pagan Rhythms. Mm -hmm. So Spirit World, first of all, Century Media Band, and from the hotbed of heavy metal that is Las Vegas, said... No one ever. <laughs> like, Jesus Christ, these guys are from Las Vegas. I cannot believe that. Like, I don't think I've ever really seen a high-profile band coming from that part of the country. No. Um, but, you know, I guess I shouldn't be surprised with, like, uh, they, they have that huge festival in Vegas now. Um, boy, Psycho Billy. I can't remember. Not Psycho Billy. I don't know what. There's a 
big old festival out there uh, in Vegas now that's metal centric huh. that I I need to see. Uh, but this band, Spirit World, is just thrashy death metal with tons of groove, and they they intertwine some interesting Western elements. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether those Western elements are kind of like um, you know some sound drops of gospel or uh, like uh, country and Western sort of uh, rock vibes at times, even like that doesn't that's not the meat and potatoes of their sound. So don't even worry if you're thinking like that's not for me, but. Why did I choose this album for Halloween? This is the perfect uh, sort of pagan, dark, uh, reveling and rock and roll spirit album that I could come up with. The most like satanic panic, uh, 1980s Christian terror album that I could think of because this is thrashy death metal uh, with sound bites from preachers and news anchors and movies. And all of these sound bites are all predicated around like the danger of rock and roll, the danger of heavy metal. And it just brought me back to a time when both movies and uh, music were at the center point of so many like people's fears about our youth being taken over by some sort of invisible black cloth. And of course it's all fucking bullshit. It's all just suburban moms with nothing else to do. But that being said, I have always, you know, I've always kind of pontificated on the fact that I like heavy metal to feel dangerous. This feels like a dangerous album. It feels like it's got the rebel spirit of rock and roll Mm -hmm. very much in it. It's just tribal sounding. Um, It's extremely masculine um, this, this, I feel corny. This album straight up has some big dick energy. Like when you listen to it, you are just going to feel power and headbang like hell because these, they've got some thrash riffs that are, Ooh, boy, they oh, are yeah. something, um, on par with like, I mean, like I'm look, I'm not going to, uh, make uh, the hyperbolic statement of the year here and call them Slayer. They are not, but they put together some riffs that'll make you bang your head. Like you were seeing Slayer. Um, and that's like the highest praise I feel like I could give them. Uh, the production's really well done. It's got a lot of punch and clarity. It's just some heavy metal, heavy metal that feels urgent. So spirit world, spirit, spirit world, pagan rhythms. I give it uh eight, e, uh, totally evaporated, uh, spinal discs, uh, out of 10. Ooh. So if you haven't, yes, uh, eight slip discs is what I'm going to give it. And it may not go down as a genre classic, but it will be spinning on my uh, turntable for years to come. Yeah, and I will uh, back up what you're saying about Spirit World. Uh, uh, that album, you told me about it, I listened to it, and I was just thrashing out the entire time. Uh, can't say enough good things about it. Um, I loved it from cover to cover. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and like you said, the ri- some of the riffs that they came up with make you feel like you're at a Slayer concert, and I will 100% back that because some of the riffs they came up with are just, oh, man, it, they're just so fucking rad, um, and it makes me excited uh, for their album coming out very soon, I believe, uh, uh, Death Western. Death Western. Yeah, I'm super excited for that one. Um, they have some singles out for that one. If you haven't uh, checked them out, give them a listen because they are pretty goddamn good. Very excited for that album to come out. I think I'm going to update my score. I know I said 8 out of 10 slip discs. I think this is, since 4 out of 5 plastic surgeons recommend total facial reconstruction after listing this album, I'm going to give it 8 fractured orbital bones out of 10. <laughs> Updated score for you. All right. Uh, well, uh, kind of keeping in the theme of uh, Halloween and Spooky, we got uh, Storm Ruler as my pick. Now... Storm Ruler, as some of you may have picked up, uh, or you know that read through the uh, episode description, Storm Ruler uh, was gracious enough to let uh, let us use uh, clips from uh, one of their songs, "Blood of the Old Wolf," and uh, they came out with a new album, uh, "Sacred Rites and Black Magic," just came out on the fourteenth. Um, and let me tell you, this album is fantastic. There's really nothing else to say about it. Uh, I was excited for storm ruler when we saw them in concert picked up their album and was immediately excited even more excited for what they had uh you know re- uh, their f- future releases excuse me um and this just solidifies that excitement i kind of get like dis- dissection vibes you know storm of the lights bane uh vibes from this oh definitely definitely from this album like for sure and that's that's a good thing like absolutely um the solos throughout the entire album are just 
incredible like it just it, it's it's nice because like it makes the good like the the guitar sings almost in like a creepy like siren siren-esque kind of way um if you know what i'm saying and there's like these little thematic like like slow down tracks they're only like anywhere from like 30 to seconds to like a minute long that kind of just help set the tone set the tone and kind of like help flesh out the story uh of the album uh before the mayhem ensues again entranced with the uh tra- entranced within the moon presence is probably definitely one of my favorite songs off that track it's so fucking good there's parts of the album where i also get like some thrashy vibes uh as well just a lot of they definitely know how to rock the fuck oh out. my god they do it's a, it it makes me want to don like my war paint you know what i mean like get some get some eye black and just like you know and then like you know go screaming into battle or something like that with like a rusty like battle axe or something like it just makes you feel like your but bu- the best art just makes you feel period, oh yeah right? exactly and, and I, I um like i said i was excited for these guys before and i i just I, I just wish them all the best. And again, huge shout out to Storm Ruler for letting us use, you know, little cl- snippets of uh, of uh, Blood of the Old Wolf um, because there's not a better intro or outro for the show. But yeah, that's uh, that's I, I'd say I'd give it uh, uh, five explodingly stuffed franny packs out of five. And and we again, we'll, we'll we'll figure out what a franny pack is and what's the function of it. We don't know yet. Nobody knows. But yeah, it, my theory right now, I think that a, a franny pack is like a Capri Sun filled with mercury. <laughs> that's what. That's a good. That's what I'm thinking. That, well, I mean, dude, Capri Sun in and itself isn't far off of mercury. This stuff is po- po- poison. But yeah, uh, Sacred Rites and Black Magic. Go definitely check that out because that album crushes. I mean, I think that's your first perfect score. So that tells me. I, I, I absorbed a couple of the singles, but I haven't heard the whole album. So I now that just shot to the, the top of my cue you list, I'll be exploring it. that right away. And yeah, of course, I'm so thankful that that we can use Storm Ruler's music because it just sets the whole ambiance that the Druids need every episode. So, well, Franny, we've been on quite the journey. We've been we've been passing out candy. We've been watching Ernest Scared Stupid. We've been fucking pinhead and enjoying ourselves. <laughs> And I, I have to say, I think, uh, I don't know exactly what I'm doing tonight yet. I think we, uh, me and the gal might, uh, go out as some zombies with our faces painted up and get a libation or two and get home safely. Maybe throw on Bride of Chucky. I don't know, but it's Halloween. I'm ready to party. What do you got going on? Well, currently as this album launches, I am in Mexico City right now. So Day of the Dead is happening all over the place. So, I mean, there's going to be parties everywhere. So I can't wait to get my face all uh, candy skull painted up. Go out and have a good time with with my... uh, uh, Mexican brothers and sisters down south there, so it's gonna be a it's gonna be a hell of a good time and super fucking jacked for that. So, well, we look forward for the full druidic report of the Day of the Dead, and hope you return in one piece. And until then, I thank all of you druids. I'm gonna pass it over to Franny, who's got some important thoughts and messages for you. Thank you once again for joining us. Yep, uh, as uh, as Rex said, uh, thank you guys so much for listening. We really appreciate it for everybody that's been around since episode one keep uh keep on listening keep staying with us and uh make sure you reach out to us on either instagram or twitter um uh, let us know what you're listening to what uh, what you want us to listen to also if you have any questions about us or any album suggestions or you know any suggestions at all or you know asking like what we're wearing or whatever Make sure. What do you wear in your first date with Pinhead? <laughs> yeah. That's what I want to talk about. Yeah, drop drop comments on our socials and then uh, also reach out to us, uh, Druids of Doom Podcast at gmail dot com. Um, you know, we're pretty responsive. You know, uh, like I said, just reach out to us and let us know what you're listening to, what we should be listening to. What, what let us know what uh, you want us to discuss in the future. If you're a Pinhead with a cat and nine tails, lightly slapping my ass, we're very responsive. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um but yeah like i said uh, just hit us hit us up wherever you can and keep on listening um and with that being said always make sure to stick around for the next episode of druids of 